Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. And today I'm going to be uh, discussing some uh, joint work with uh, Leonard Kogan at, at, at MIT Sloan and Coach John at NYU Stern. And the topic is going to be a survey that we're writing for the annual review of financial economics on the topic of smart contracts and uh, decentralized finance. Uh, so um, I'm actually in this presentation going to be tracking basically the structure of the survey. Um, so in particular, I want to actually start by clarifying the mechanics of smart contracts so that we understand you know, what actually can be done and what can't be done using smart contracts. I'm then going to transition to discussing sort of more on the economics of it. What are the high level benefits that, that smart contracts can provide? Things like overcoming commitment problems. With that said, I think one of the issues that frequently arises when people talk about smart contracts is that they get truly imaginative about what these things might be able to do. Uh, but the truth is that they are somewhat limited. And so I'm going to spend some time talking about limitations. Um, and then I'm going to use that structure basically uh, to discuss uh, the actual applications that are already live, particularly as it pertains to finance. So this is sometimes or frequently referred to as decentralized finance. Now, let me say uh, before I get into this, um, the particularly sort of the, the opening of this um, presentation, because it's heavy on some of the institutional details, uh, if you have clarifying questions, um, it'll be useful to, to take them at that point. Um, so, you know, don't be shy about, about asking questions. We will have a Q&A at the end, uh, but, but it might be particularly important if something is not clear to, to uh, deal with that up front. Um, but so with that, um, actually, before I get into the, uh, the mechanics, I want to provide a little bit of motivation because it always makes sense, I think, before you dive into a topic to ask the question about, you know, why is this even worth discussing in the first place? And as it pertains actually sort of blockchain more generally, I think there's been uh, a bit of a, a feeling uh, going back to when Bitcoin was initially announced that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about things that blockchains can do, but maybe there's not so much that's actually being done. And so there's sometimes a bit of a skepticism around the idea that, well, is it really worth discussing these topics given that maybe a lot of it is just conceptualized but not actually realized? But you see, a couple of years ago, that sort of changed in terms of the fact that a lot of the, a lot of the things that, that people were conceptualizing and theorizing about actually started to materialize in practice. And one way I want to highlight that is, is this thing that I have um, on the slide here, which is, and I'll talk about, about the, the sort of specific application here in more detail, but right now, just at a high level, uh, in, on, on the Ethereum blockchain right now, we have these things called uh, protocols for loanable funds, or, or maybe a, a sort of a simpler way of framing it, uh, a lending platform. And on these lending platforms, you can basically get um, something that's very close to, you can think of as a deposit account. But one big difference is that the yields on these accounts are quite substantial as compared to what you would get on a checking or even a savings account in practice. So what you're looking at here is a particular, you know, what I'm showing you here is the front end of a particular lending platform known as Aave. And in this platform, you can take what's called a stable coin, a particularly, let's say, infamous stable coin in this case, which is USDT Tether. And if you deposit at Aave, what they're telling you is that you can receive 129 basis points annualized. Now, that number is clearly, as I was saying, higher than what you would anticipate from a checking account or a savings account. And your initial reaction, particularly if you're familiar with Tether, might be something like, well, yeah, but this isn't a checking or savings account. In particular, there's, there, there are potentially serious risk issues surrounding this stable coin, which is not actual dollars. And so there are potential losses from there. If you're more familiar with things about the underlying platform, you might also worry about some other risks associated with the lending platform itself. But the truth of the matter is that is an empirical question, right? Um, the fact of the matter is that, that, that for now, these platforms are still there. And for now, Tether has maintained its pegs. And so there is some potential here that this 129 basis points is capturing something other than risk, is capturing something other than regulatory arbitrage, and that it might actually be capturing value coming from the fact that this is a decentralized setting that doesn't have market power, right? I think it's fairly well accepted that the, the rates that banks give you on your checking or savings account 
are not the rates they're making on it, right? They're not passing through everything that they're making on those things. And so it's not, it, it's very easy to, for example, write a theoretical model that would show in a setting where you don't have market power that interest rates that, the, that you know, depositors would receive would go up. And so this is in that sense consistent with that idea. But at the same time, there are a lot of caveats in the sense that maybe this is reflecting risk or even regulatory arbitrage. But if it's not, then this is, this is a very serious thing to consider, right? This, this means that DeFi has already materialized to do something very important. And, and so actually, I would argue that this, this, because it's deployed, because it's realized, but because it's not clear how much of it is actual value and how much of it is risk or regulatory arbitrage, this is a reason to be studying this topic. Because if you can get uh, an extra 100 basis points on your deposit accounts, if you can get higher pass-throughs at banks and it's not risk or regulatory arbitrage, that's potentially a significant change to uh, welfare for depositors. Um, but again, that's more um, to say that this deserves some study, right? And that's, that's sort of the point of the survey with, uh, with Coase and Leonard Kogan. Um, and, uh, and so with that, let me actually sort of get into it because before we talk about lending platforms, which is one of the decentralized finance applications that I'm going to be talking about during the talk, we need to understand what exactly this means. Um, and so to do that, we kind of have to start with something relatively dry, which is if we're going to talk about smart contracts, what exactly is a smart contract? Um, well, at a, at a high level, you can think about a smart contract essentially as code, which is uploaded to a blockchain. Um, now, what's the relevance of the blockchain here? Well, that has to do with this idea of security, which is to say that once you put something on a blockchain, it's very hard to reverse. And, and that, that gets into things about commitment, which I will touch on later. But for now, let's, let, let's sort of set, set that to the side and just think of a chunk of code, um, because that's what these smart contracts fundamentally are. Um, the code is characterized by two things, just as most chunks of code are, which is attributes and functions. Now, what is the conceptual basis or with conceptual relevance of uh, the attributes? Well, the attributes are capturing a state. You want to capture a state of reality at a point in time, and they're going to be captured through the attributes in the code. But of course, reality is dynamic. Things change. So you can't just have a, a single set of attributes that are static forevermore. That's going to be a pretty useless application if that is the case. So you need functions. Functions are going to enable transitions from state to state. So functions will allow you to change the attributes. Um, and since the attributes represent a state, that means that they're going to allow you to transition states and they're going to allow you to essentially pick up the dynamics of reality. Now, that, that might be a little bit unclear um, in terms of what that's, how that's supposed to be made concrete in practice. So let's talk about probably the simplest example, um, an example that probably got prominent, you know, maybe even five years ago when people were talking about ICOs, which is token contracts. So one of the most significant, one of the most widely used applications of smart contracts is just creating a new token. For example, what I was showing you earlier, USDT, Tether, that is a token on the Ethereum blockchain. So that's going to live in the structure that I'm describing here. So how does this attribute function architecture pertain to, let's say, the specific concrete example of a token contract? Well, what, are the, what is the state of a token contract? What should the state of a token contract be? Well, the most fundamental thing with the token contract is the balances, right? What is the state of the system of Tether? Well, who owns Tether, right? So what that means is the attributes are going to have to include something that stores the holdings effectively of the token at a point in time. So in particular, I'm going to show you that the, the, the set of attributes for uh, these token contracts include a mapping that tracks the holdings. Um, now, of course, the holdings are not static. You want to be able to move your token. You, may, you want to be able to buy or sell things and so on. And so how is that going to work? Well, you're going to need a function that's going to allow transitions in the, uh, in the holdings. So the, a function that's going to essentially enable, for example, sales of these holdings. And importantly enough, a sale in this context would just mean changing the holdings. So if I'm going to sell to somebody, it means you're drawing down um, my, my balance and you're, and you're incrementing somebody else's balance. Um, so to make that even more concrete, let's look at some actual code from, a, from an existing smart contract. Uh, so this is just two lines of a, of a larger smart contract. 
the, the top line is basically just a declaration, so you can kind of ignore that for the moment. Um, the, the second line, line 110 here, is actually the attribute I was just describing, which is this is an attribute called balances, and it literally stores the balances of the, the it, it literally stores, if you like, the distribution of holdings for the, for the uh, particular token that's, that's being looked at. Um, and so, you know, as with typical code, what you have here is the first thing on this line is actually telling you what the type is, right? With, with a computer, you gotta tell it what the type of this thing is. And so the, the data type is a mapping, um, which if you're familiar with Python, think of it as a dictionary. If you're familiar with Java, think of it as a hash map. But what it does is it maps a certain data type into another one. So address is basically your, is the way you're identified on, for example, the Ethereum blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain. So if you're interacting with the, the Ethereum blockchain, you're gonna have an address. You could have multiple, but you're gonna have at least one. And it's gonna map that address into, this is a uint 256. U stands for unsigned, int stands for integer, 256 is the size. What does that mean in plain English? It means a non-negative number. The sign doesn't matter, right? You can't have a negative balance. That's all it's saying. And so what does it mean, for example, for you to hold a unit of Tether, USDT, which is, for example, a, contra, a, 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 a token on the Ethereum blockchain? It means that if I take your address and I query this balances mapping and I plug it in, it'll output a number, which is your balance. So if you hold one, it'll output the number one. If you hold five, it'll output the number five. And one of the things I wanna emphasize is this is not an ex post recording of your holding, okay? This is not somebody after the fact saying, oh, you own five and it's you know, validated elsewhere. You owning Tether is, what it means is that that, that, that that balances data structure says that you own that amount, okay? This is finality of settlement. Um, the, the actual settlement of these tokens is taking place on the blockchain, and the meaning of settlement means that you have essentially adjusted this balances uh, uh, attribute to, to reflect whatever the holding is. So owning one token means that the, the this this, uh, this this data sorry this uh, this attribute underscore balances evaluated at your address is equal to one. Owning two tokens would mean it's equal to two. Owning three would mean it's equal to three. Owning nothing would mean it's equal to zero. Okay, so. Uh, so, so that's, for example, a very concrete uh, uh, way of, of understanding attributes um, uh, for, for a token contract. But um, to sort of extend this further, you can also look at the functions that I was describing earlier. So how exactly um, do, you, uh, do you, for example, alter the state, which in this case, the most obvious way you would want to alter the state is I want to give you some tokens or, or buy something using these tokens. Well, that boils down to a function that is a transfer function. So you can see on line 345 that, um, that the declaration is, is, is even, is, that it's a function with that name. And you know, there's a lot of code here, but you can kind of fixate on just the ones that I have in green to, to highlight this point that I was making about how settlement works here. In, in this first green line, all that's happening is it's reading the balances from some party, which is labeled from here. Right, then it's on the next line, it's deducting the amount that it's supposed to deduct, and then it's adding it to the other party, right? And that is, final that's again, not an ex post recording, that's finality of settlement, right? And that's actually supposed to be one of the efficiencies here, right? It's being done just through these lines of code, it's not any more complicated than just running uh, a bunch of lines of code. So hopefully that clarifies something about, you know, the way smart contracts mechanically operate, because I wanna use that structure when we talk about higher level things here. But, you know, this example, it might, or I imagine it probably feels a little bit unsatisfying because, you know, the whole idea of smart contracts was to move beyond payments. And I've just given you a payment application, which seems kind of like, what is the point of all this machinery if this is all you can do with it? Well, so I want to briefly take you back to my motivational example um, before I give a little more context on how these things uh, work um, in, more mechanically. Um, because I, I want to try to appreciate kind of what's happening in this particular example and the complexity of it. Um, so I just pointed out that Tether, this USDT thing, is a token contract. So it has a, it has a smart contract that, that corresponds to it. But this lending platform is also going to be a, uh, well, it's actually going to be a set of smart contracts, but the point is it's a separate entity um, within the world of smart contracts. And so what's happening here actually is it's not just you interacting with some smart contract. 
it's you interacting with a bunch of others with a bunch of smart contracts and they have to interact with each other which means that there's going to have to be a little bit more complexity in terms of the interactions involved and in particular as i'm going to show you um, in a little bit the way this is actually working is that when you want to go to this lending platform and say okay give me this 129 basis points i have a bunch of tether right because that balances attribute says that i have a bunch of tether um, I want you to give me this 129 basis points. The way it operationally actually works is that you basically have to approach this contract for Aave, meaning the lending platform, and you have to tell the lending platform, you know that balances attribute where it says that I have the funds? You can take mine and then give me the, give me the yield out of it. Now, that may sound um, not that complicated, but from the, from the technical perspective, there's a little bit of a subtlety involved because what that means is that the contracts have to interact with each other, right? So the lending platform basically has to face the, uh, the token contract and has to essentially ask the token contract for your holdings, which introduces a slight issue, right? Which is that if, 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 the, if the Tether contract is always willing to give up your holdings to this third party, that's a security risk. That's one way to steal your money, right? If that always happens because you're not involved in that interaction. So one of the things that, that's embedded in these... Uh, that's embedded in, in the structure of these, uh, these typical token contracts is another attribute that's called allowances, which basically facilitates the uh, interaction of smart contracts with each other. So this, 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 this allowances thing is a bit more complicated of a structure because what it does is it allows another smart contract to receive your token. So in particular, I need to let the lending platform contract receive my tokens from Tether, right? Um, and so what, what you need to do basically is you need to actually, uh, you, you need to actually tell Tether that it's okay to give up some of your tokens. And then, then, then that transfer is going to be allowed. So how does this mechanically work? Well, literally in, in the, there's a function, um, in, in the, uh, in, in, in the contract that, that, that's called approve. And it asks to specify who you are, who you're willing to give your tokens to and what the amount is. And it's then directly reflected in this allowance as a tribute. So basically, you go to the Tether contract and say, look, I'm cool with Aave taking five of my tokens. And then the Tether contract stores it in this allowance attribute, tribute, exactly like this. So line 437 is exactly where it's happening. It's saying, OK, I'm going to say that Fahad says it's OK to give, so owner is Fahad in this case. Spender is going to be Aave, and amount is going to be the amount. And it's going to directly store it there. And, and then, how is this actually supposed to, how is this actually supposed to mechanically happen? Well, you know, one way to think about a blockchain, even beyond the idea of a smart contracts blockchain, is that it has a bunch of blocks and the blocks are just a bunch of transactions. And some people think that that characterization is a sort of a Bitcoin a specific transaction where you're just thinking about payments because when you talk about transactions, that must be payments. But the truth is, even with smart contracts, the blocks are just a bunch of transactions. It's just that the meaning of transactions are richer. So how does this interaction with the lending platform and the smart contract work? Uh, or rather, let's say this, this last interaction I was referencing about, about telling the Tether contract that, uh, that it's OK to, to give some of your tokens to the lending platform. Well, you form a transaction where you are going to be the sender, and the receiver is going to be the smart contract you want to talk to. So everything on the Ethereum blockchain, everything on a smart contract blockchain is just a bunch of transactions. The difference is that when you do, want to do something richer than payments, what you're going to do is you're going to identify the smart contract you want to interact with. And then mechanically how that happens is that you choose yourself as the, as the sender of the transaction and you choose the, the contract as the recipient. So all these chunks of codes have, all these chunks of code have addresses on the Ethereum blockchain and you can identify them by their addresses. They have identities just like you do. So what you're looking at here is, is now an interface that shows you, uh, the, that essentially shows you the blockchain. And so each row is actually a transaction. So every transaction has a unique identifier, which is referred to as its hash. It's on some block, and it has a sender and a receiver. If you want to tell Tether that it's okay for some of your tokens to be given to Aave, well, then you're the sender of the transaction, and the receiver is going to be Tether. And there's another important piece here, which is you see this method column. What you're doing is you're saying, run that chunk of code. And so you have to identify what the chunk of code is, and that's what this method is doing. 
it's referring to the function that you want to run. So if you dig into, for example, one of these transactions, you'll see one of the fields is this thing called input data. And what's the input data? It's the function, right? So you're identifying by the sender of the transaction, you're identifying the address of the chunk of code. And then in the input data, you're saying with well, a specific chunk of code I want to run, is this function approved? And, and, as, and, and you can see then what happens internally in the code here. So this, this, this function approved, um, because, because the blockchain is public, I can actually pull the exact code that's being run. And that's what, I, that's what I'm doing here, right? So when you create the transaction, it knows you know, you're the sender because you're the person creating it. So it defines that as owner, and then it calls that function I was showing you earlier, underscore approved, where you're the owner, the spender is whomever you want it to be. So in this case, it would be the lending platform, and the amount is the amount that you want to be willing to allow to give to, um, to, give to uh, the, the platform. So this this I'll come to in more detail in the decentralized finance section. But the truth, but the, but the truth. So I'll give you a high level answer. Actually, what they usually do is they give you another token that they created, which represents something like ownership in the enterprise, and that's how things get paid out. Uh, because they have to, uh, otherwise there would be the risk that they're going to run away with your money, right? So they're giving you something else that ends up being exchangeable later and is going to capture that interest. Um, are there any other questions at this point about the mechanics of what's happening here? Because after this, I'm going to go a little bit more high level. Um, okay. So, uh, so then let me let me leave that alone and, and go a bit more to the high level. Um, so you know, you might say, well, well, this seems like uh, a lot of machinery, uh, and and what's the point of all this machinery? Particularly, you know, we're at a finance conference here. There must be some finance value here. This is not just about uh, about code, right? Um, and so the, the, the main benefit of this sort of structure is that it can overcome commitment issues. This goes back to something that I'm, that I'm not you know, talking about in detail here in this presentation, which has to do with the underlying security of the blockchain. But at a high level, the way you want to think about it is, look, if I upload code to the blockchain, or rather, let me take Tether, since I was talking about calling a function from Tether. If Tether uploads some code to the blockchain, uh, like this code, this particular function, Tether can't change that function after the fact, or it's very, very difficult to, to change that code after the fact, right? They've tied their own hands. So essentially, you no longer have a credible commitment issue from the perspective of, is it going to be incentive compatible for Tether to follow through with this particular course of action? Because they put this up, and now it's not feasible for them not to follow through with it, right? They don't control the running of the code. They've tied their own hands uh, by putting this code up, and now you can run whatever part of the code that you like. And they can't do anything about it, right? So it overcomes commitment issues in that particular way. And so let me offer a very self-contained example of this, which goes to you know, something that, again, was quite famous a few years ago, which is initial coin offering. When you do an initial coin offering, the way it usually would work is I send, you, uh, I, I send uh, some ether in, and they give me uh, the, whatever the coin of the initial coin offering happens to be. Um, and, 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 and the sort of primary, part, primary market part of it uh, might, uh, well, sometimes has code that looks something like this. So this is actually from a, from a specific ICO, a very simple version of it. Um, and since it's sort of a chunk in the middle of the code, you're going to have to use your intuition a little bit for what some of these uh, objects mean. But kind of reading it out, it says, if now is less than or equal to bonus n. So it's basically saying, if the moment right now is before some some particular period, uh, which here is called bonus ends, then the tokens you're going to receive is the value you're sending in, typically in Ether, times 1,200. Whereas if now is not before that bonus ends, then the tokens you're going to receive is the value you're sending in times 1,000. So what's this doing? It's credibly committing to giving you 1,200 um, 1, units of the new token per Ether if you do it, if, if you enter into this ICO early, and otherwise it's credibly committing to giving you 1,000, right? The point is that whoever uploaded this code can't change that number 1,200, can't change that number 1,000, can't change that if statement. Once they've done it, it's done. They can't do it. I mean, they, they can't change anything. Now, as, as, a, as an aside here, um, this is not Tether's contract. Um, and uh, if you actually look at Tether's contract, you'll notice that they don't hard code very much because uh, uh, one thing that you can do if, uh, 
if you're trying to, let's say, uh, if, if you don't necessarily have the best incentives in this case, um, is you could end up, instead of putting a hard-coded number here, you could end up putting another attribute that you give yourself access to change through a function. And that's actually what the tether contract does for a lot of stuff. It creates a trap door where it can sort of manipulate things um, uh, as it sees fit. Um, so so the, 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 there is the ability to credibly commit to things. But this second point I'm making right now is that um, it is worthwhile to actually look at what the code says because just because there is the ability to credibly commit, that doesn't mean that they're credibly committing to everything that you might think that they are. Right? Just like with any chunk of code, you can build in lots and lots of discretion. And so, you, you, you may, so particularly as it comes to thinking about fraudulent behavior in this space, a lot of times it's just people interacting with smart contracts without understanding what the smart contract can actually do. Um, if the contract has a bunch of discretion and you think it doesn't, well, then, then, then outcomes may, you know, may diverge from what you're expecting. But in principle, there is the ability to entirely tie their hands because they cannot change the original code that they post up. Um, up to the security of the particular blockchain. And I, and I will say in practice, you know, Ethereum is a fairly uh, secure blockchain, I would say. So this is, this is sort of the, the, the main benefit that's supposed to arise out of smart contracts. But when it comes to discussing smart contracts, um, people get truly imaginative about the sorts of things that they can do with these things. And I think one of the most important points is to temper that imagination um, in understanding exactly what are the limitations associated with using, uh, with using smart contracts. And so I'm going to specifically break up the sort of limitations that arise into two groups. One is technical limitations, and the other is economic limitations. So what's one way to think of technical limitations? Well, that's like saying the feasible region of things you can do is not infinite. Not everything that you can conjure up with your mind is something that can even be done. So this is about the feasible region, the feasible set of actions. But just because something is feasible doesn't mean it's optimal, right? Just because it's in the feasible region doesn't mean it will arise in equilibrium, right? The second set of limitations is to tailor to that. There are things that you can do with the Ethereum blockchain that you don't see done. A very good example that, that a lot of people you know, speculate about is, for example, using machine learning algorithms. To, you, know, you crowdsource data and you use some ML algorithms um, for whatever purpose to predict whatever you like. This is something that you, in principle, could do. But it turns out it's a very bad idea to do it. Like it, 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 it turns out that it's quite cost prohibitive, having to do with the, with the particular structure of the, of the blockchain. So first part is about the feasible region. Second part is going to be, even within the feasible region, what is actually um, not likely to arise in equilibrium, at least given current sort of, uh, sort of costs of computation and so on. So, yeah, let's talk about the first part, technical limitations, the feasible region itself. So here are a couple of things, or three things rather, that, uh, that you can't really do um, with, with smart contracts. One is you cannot enforce ownership of physical assets, right? So you've probably heard these examples of, well, what if we were to trade real estate on a blockchain? Now, let's be careful about what that exactly means. So you're going to see in a moment that for every one of these things, uh, computer scientists and practitioners are extremely resourceful. So they always have a workaround, which is not perfect, uh, which, I, which I'll discuss for each of these cases. But, but because it's not perfect, I think it's important to understand the, the limitation. So for example, when I say, when you think about something like trading real estate on a blockchain, you cannot enforce ownership of real estate through a blockchain. A blockchain is a digital object. If I say, if, if I have a blockchain record that you own a house and somebody goes and occupies that house, the blockchain is not going to strike down that human being, and there's no way to get the blockchain to do that, right? It's the same thing as if you have a deed to a house and somebody goes and occupies your house, the physical piece of paper is not going to, you know, remove the person from your house. Now, the cops might remove the person from your house, right? Which is if they recognize the deed as the legitimate, uh, as your legitimate ownership. But so the point is the blockchain can serve in the role of the deed in the sense that it can be the record that says that you own this thing but it can't substitute for the actual enforcement mechanism in, let's say, the police, right? So, so the idea of doing, the idea of you know, trading physical assets, for example, on a blockchain is going to have to go through the traditional enforcement mechanism because a digital object, of course, cannot, uh, cannot enforce uh, something that, is, that happens in the physical world. So, so that's kind of one, one, one important limitation. Another one 
um, that, that, that again, I think is, is, is quite prominent is that blockchains, at least, you know, blockchains like Ethereum cannot settle fiat currency, right? The, uh, the Ethereum blockchain doesn't have the power to create new US dollars. That would be considered counterfeit, right? Um, so, so, so that, of course, is, that, that, of course, introduces the issue of, of risk when you are trading tokens on the Ethereum blockchain because the Ethereum blockchain, again, cannot just create dollars out of, any, uh, out of thin air and have you, have you start trading those things. Finally, a third, uh, a third thing that, that's important to realize that these smart contracts can't do is that they can code conditional logic, but they can't condition on arbitrary events. So for example, if I wanted to write a contract that where I credibly committed to paying you some ether, let's say, if the Falcons win the Super Bowl, right? The Ethereum blockchain knows if I own ether, I could upload a chunk of code that ties my hands about giving you the ether, and I could write an if statement in there, but what's supposed to go in the if statement? Like, how is the blockchain going to know that the Falcons won the Super Bowl? Um, now, again, these are these are limitations, um, but they're but these are these are hard limitations. But that doesn't mean that there aren't workarounds. And as I was saying, practitioners and computer scientists are quite resourceful. So let's talk about some of the uh, some of the workarounds they've come up with. So in the case of you know trying to enforce ownership of physical assets, well, how's this how's this supposed to work? Well, what if I say you know that house I want to sell, I'm going to create a token that represents ownership in the house. This actually would technically be a non-fungible token uh, because the house is different than every other house, presumably. Um, and so the idea then is that just as you can have a deed to the house, now we have this token contract that stores the owner of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the NFT, which represents ownership in the physical asset. And so I can keep track of the owner of this asset through the blockchain. But again, it doesn't substitute for the enforcement mechanism. It substitutes for the deed. And you know, I, I think a lot of people would reasonably argue that there's an advantage to having the settlement done digitally in a secure setting, um, relative to doing it on a relative to doing it on a piece of paper. But again, it's not an all-encompassing solution because you can't get it because you still have to deal with the traditional enforcement mechanism. So the second one, settle fiat currencies. This one, I'm sure, you know, almost everybody can guess what the workaround is. It may not be a satisfactory workaround, but this is where stablecoins come from, right? We can't create US dollars on the Ethereum blockchain, we can create Tether, we can create USDC, we can create DAI, right? And so that's the basic workaround that they have. Either, you know, so for example, USDC and USDT, the idea is we're gonna create this token and we'll back it off chain. Now, obviously you can't verify what's going on off chain, on chain, but, um, but, uh, but, but it, is, it, it is sort of a practical workaround in the sense these stable coins have actually been able to largely maintain, well, not all of them, certainly, but you know, USDC and USDT have been fairly successful um, in terms of maintaining their peg over time. And so, um, so that's the workaround on that one. On the last one, conditioning on arbitrary events, um, this is where, so this is actually uh, what's referred to as the Oracle problem. And, and, the, and the basic solution to it is that, well, you have external parties feed information to the blockchain. Now, in a room full of economists, when you hear something like that, you should immediately start to think, well, how can you ensure that people are going to actually feed the correct information in? How do you know they're not just going to make stuff up? Um, and that actually is, 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 a, is a good question that hasn't been sufficiently explored. Um, there's a lot of work on oracles in the computer science literature, but they tend, to just, uh, they tend to just take the view that, well, if a lot of people are providing the information, then, 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 you're, going to get, uh, then you're going to get the true value. And, and it's very easy to show like existence of an equilibrium where everybody reports the, the true thing because you can punish people for, you know, for deviating, but that doesn't mean there aren't other equilibria. And that doesn't mean this is going to, uh, uh, that doesn't mean this is stable. Um, in practice, of course, oracles are used and, and, and they, you know, they do seem to work as a practical matter. But again, this might be a case of something like there is an equilibrium, which is the good equilibrium, but that doesn't mean that there aren't, there aren't gonna be issues down the road. So actually all of these limitations and the, and, the, and the workaround solutions that they have really actually provide opportunities, I think, for people interested in this area because, because the truth is these things are kind of working, but it's not clear that they're fundamentally sustainable. So anyway, these are, these are a bunch of technical limitations. Um, the other set that I was saying, economic limitations. Um, so now what I'm talking about is what are things that you can do, but you're probably not gonna to wanna to do it for one reason or another, particularly cost. So first at a high level, let me say, 
a lot of people seem to think blockchains are supercomputers because there's a lot of computation involved with them. That is not true. In fact, it's very nearly the opposite of the truth. Sorry, the truth. Um, the blockchains are highly inefficient at computing. They do involve a lot of computational power, um, and I'm not even alluding to proof of work here. I'm talking about even without proof of work, they involve a lot of computational power, but it's not being used efficiently, and it's not being used efficiently on purpose. That is to say that blockchains by construction have redundant computation and redundant storage. Why is that? Well, validators are not supposed to trust each other. The entire, in some sense, the entire point of the system is that it's supposed to be trustless. You say you ran this code and the outcome is whatever. How do I know that you didn't just, that, that that outcome really happened? How do I know that you're not just telling me something that benefits you? Well, I guess I could run the code myself to check on you. But what does that mean? That means we're both running the same code. How efficient is that? Not very efficient, right? So by construction, you have redundant computation. And in fact, the more binding thing in practice is redundant storage. Because I'm not gonna trust that you stored the balances of USDT correctly. I need to store it too, so that I know that it's correct. And then this, and then to the extent that you have multiple validators, now you have even more than, you, know, you, you have everybody basically storing the same information and running the same code, right? And somebody has to pay for this, right? If all these validators are gonna store all this information and gonna run these chunks of code, why are they gonna do it? They're not benevolent. They're doing it because somebody's paying them. And who's gonna pay them? Well, the users who are sending in the transactions ultimately have to foot the bill for it. So, for example, that uh, I was saying, imagine you, you, think of a, you think of crowdsourcing data on a blockchain and then running machine learning algorithms over top of it. Who is going to pay the cost for this? Well, it's whoever's asking for the exercises to be run. And if you want to run some sophisticated computation like an ML algorithm across lots and lots of nodes, that's gonna be really expensive, particularly as it compares to something like Amazon Web Services. So you have to ask yourself, do you actually want to pay that cost? And in practice, Probably not, right? So I wouldn't anticipate, at least in the near term, seeing applications like that, precisely because whatever is being done, it has to be duplicated. So essentially the cost has to be scaled up proportionally, and then you have to ask the user who is asking for this stuff to be run, does the user, is the user really willing to pay multiples of the, of the cost they would otherwise have to pay just for the sake of getting this sort of trustless environment? Um, and again, in practice, I, I don't really think that it is the case that people would find these applications like ML applications to be sufficiently, or they, I don't think they, they would find it uh, useful to do given that they can do it in a centralized setting in a much more efficient way. Okay, so let me move to then um, applications of specific relevance to finance. Because in some sense, what I've been telling you about is for, for the last couple of slides is what you can't do. But what is actually happening, right? So I started by motivating with this lending platform and, and pointing out that there are things that are actually happening now in the world of blockchain. And that's why this, this term decentralized finance, DeFi, has become so prominent recently, because something is actually happening. It may not be ML algorithms, but it's something else. And so the two most prominent applications, I would say, as far as finance goes, are decentralized exchanges and lending platforms. At a high level now, I'm gonna talk about each of these in, in more detail, but at a high level now, think about decentralized exchanges as just a centralized exchange, but there's no intermediary in the middle. Um, and think of a lending platform as, you know, almost you can think about it as a bank, but without an intermediary in the middle. And what's gonna be intermediating is going to be a chunk of code. Um, so either a smart contract or a bunch of smart contracts. But, or rather, so moving into the first of these, decentralized exchanges. So how do decentralized exchanges or DEXs for short operate? Well, they operate through these things called liquidity pools, where a liquidity pool is just a smart contract. So again, a smart contract is just a chunk of code uploaded to the blockchain. So what I'm saying is these DEXs are a bunch of chunks of code that were uploaded to the blockchain, and these chunks of code can interact with each other. Now, the liquid, each liquidity pool is going to own a bunch of assets. So it might own some USDT. It might own some Ether. And remember, we talk about what ownership means. It, if I say I own USDT, it just means that that balances attribute says that I have whatever. If it's one, then it says that I have one unit. If it's two, it's, it says that I have two units, et cetera, right? So mechanically, it should be clear how something like this can happen, right? This liquidity pool has an address and, and, and the Tether contract could update its balance, its balances attribute by saying that the value um, for, that, for that address is equal to whatever number, right? 
so, so the ownership of the inventory is hopefully clear um, as how it works. But then if you want to think about it from the user side, okay, fine, there's a liquidity pool that owns some inventory. How do I interact with it? Well, actually what you're doing is you're swapping assets with the pool. So to take an example, uh, to take an example, a liquidity pool might hold ETH, meaning e Ether, uh, the base asset on Ethereum, and USDC. USDC is a stable coin, right? The, uh, USDC it has, it has its own smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and so a liquidity pool might own each of these. So if I want to buy Ether from this DEX through this liquidity pool, what does that mean? It means I'm going to give it some ETH. Uh, sorry, I'm going to give it some USDC and it's going to give me some of its ETH because it owns ETH and USDC. It can just give me some ETH and I can give it some USDC. If I want to sell ETH, what does that mean? That means the opposite swap. I'm going to give it some of my ETH and it's going to give me some USDC. And mechanically, hopefully it's clear now how this actually operates uh, because it's just basically, you know, the, the, the USDC contract updating its balance as a tribute as we're, as we're asking. Um, but, you know, there are a couple of questions here, even at the mechanical level, which is, Okay, you may understand what it means for the pool to have inventory. That is, that balances attribute at that particular address has whatever value the inventory is. But how does it get the inventory? Where does it come from, right? There's no centralized entity. So who, who gave it the inventory? How, can it, how does it have Ether and USDC in the first place? So that's one thing I want to deal with. And the second thing is, this swap, if I want to buy ETH, who determines how much USDC I give for the ETH? Where does that come from? The pricing, in effect. What is the, how does the pricing work here? Because there's no centralized intermediary. So let's deal with those two things. First, how does the pool get its inventory? Well, it has to get the inventory in a decentralized fashion. Um, what does that mean exactly? Well, it has to provide incentives for people to give it inventory. So this is a setting where anybody can provide it inventory. In, in principle, if you hold some ETH and you hold some USDC, you can give the pool, even, you can give the pool some inventory. The question is, why would you do it? Because there's an incentive structure to get you to do it. Um, what is the incentive structure? Well, if you give it your inventory, you basically receive an ownership share in the liquidity pool. Um, so this is sort of what I was alluding to earlier, although I think we were talking about lending platforms, but you'll see that the, the mechanisms are very similar across, across these sorts of applications. Um, in terms of when you give up something to a smart contract, say when you decide to give it some inventory, you need to get something in return so to ensure that you actually get your payoff. And so essentially you will get a token that represents ownership in the liquidity pool. Um, and I'll clarify why that ownership might be worthwhile in, in, in the next slide, but, but, at, but at a high level here, you're basically buying into this enterprise um, and, and your ownership is gonna be proportional to kind of what you're putting in, okay? So that's, that's, that's sort of why you might give it inventory. Um, what about the pricing? Who determines what the, prices, what the prices are that traders trade at? Well, so this is where this term automated market maker comes from. An automated market maker is just a mechanical algorithm that determines the prices. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is this is not static prices, pricing. It's not something like, oh, the price of Ether is always going to be one for one or 2,000 to one or whatever with, uh, with a stable coin. It is a function. Um, and, and particularly, what happens is these functions depend on things like trade sizes. So you, you're not going to get the same price if you want a, want, you know, want a larger trade size typically. And, and the way these AMMs are typically structured is that, the, is that prices increase as the inventory depletes. Another way of saying it is that there's positive price impact. The pricing function is increasing convex and typically actually goes to infinity as, you, as the inventory size goes to zero. And this, by the way, actually has a practical sense to it, right? Because remember, these are just smart contracts. So when somebody queries a smart contract and says, hey, I want to buy 100 Ether, what if there are only 100 Ether in the liquidity pool? You would kill the liquidity pool because you take out all the Ether and then there's nothing left. So how does the, how does the typical AMM function called a constant product AMM function? The price increases and it goes to infinity as you hit the entire pool size. So if, you want to, if there are 100 Ether in the pool, the mechanical algorithm that they're using is going to require you to post infinitely many tether or USDC in, in the example I was giving. And you don't have infinitely many USDC, so that won't happen. But more generally, what it typically does is that the price impact uh, increases um, as, as the amount that you're buying increases. 
so so anyway, there's a mechanical algorithm, and and though let's let's think about though some incentive issues that arise um, in this setting. So, okay, there's a mechanical algorithm. What could go wrong? Well, there are other places where you can buy ether, right? You can go buy ether at Coinbase, for example, and Coinbase isn't controlled by a mechanical algorithm, which means, for example, if there's news about what's going on with Ethereum, Coinbase might go, hey, look, Ethereum just did this, this, this wonderful thing. Ether prices should be higher. Let me, you know, let me reflect that through my pricing. But the DEX can't do that. The DEX is just an algorithm. It doesn't know how to pick up on this information, right? So what can happen is dislocations in prices across venues. The DEX price can't respond to inform market information directly, but centralized exchanges can, which means arbitrage opportunities are going to open in the normal course of events. So think about, for example, let's say the price of Ether is initially $2,000 per, per, let's say, the stablecoin USDC. And let's say initially the price is aligned with what's happening at centralized exchange. And then some, some wonderful event happens for Ethereum, and the price goes to 2500 so now I can buy and sell Ether at the decentralized exchange at 2000 because it can't reflect the new information. And I can buy and sell it at the centralized exchange at 2500 This is an arbitrage opportunity. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go buy at the decentralized exchange at 2000 and sell at, uh, at the centralized exchange at 2500 Now, as I was saying, I'm going to start depleting the inventory of the DEX in ETH which means that the price is going to start to climb. And so eventually, the price will relocate. And you will once again have realignment. But in the meantime, this arbitrageur who's been doing this trade has been picking off the decentralized exchange. And that's kind of important, right? Because somebody is paying, somebody's on the other side of the arbitrage trade. And who specifically is it? It's the pool owners. So if you deposited your liquidity, if you gave inventory to this pool, guess who got, just got picked off? You, right? So these dislocations are essentially disincentives to invest at pool. You can actually think of it as the pool is rebalancing, but it's getting picked off to rebalance. Normally, in, you know, in normal context, when you're rebalancing your portfolio, you're going to be doing it in a way that you're not losing money. But in this case, you're actually going to be losing money through the rebalancing precisely because you're trading at stale prices. Um, so you might say then, well, okay, if I'm going to lose Every time prices move, every time ETH prices move, there's going to be some arbitrage, and I'm going to lose. Why am I depositing my liquidity here? I could just leave my, you know, I could have left these tokens on the side, and they wouldn't have incurred these losses, right? Well, so that's why trading fees are really important in this set. There needs to be a countervailing incentive beyond, so I'm going to take these losses from the arbitrage, but there has to be something offsetting it that makes it worthwhile for me to deposit my liquidity to provide inventory uh, to this uh, liquidity pool. And that's where the trading fees come in. And so trading fees are actually, I think, a really important thing to think about where they should be set and how they should be set. But what should be immediately apparent is, you know, when we talk about DeFi, a lot of times there's a thought that, well, we can drive these sort of rents to zero. We can, we can start, we can start um, providing things at cost, right? Maybe we can provide, maybe we can, uh, in a world with, let's say, without asymmetric information, for example, when you think about some of these liquidity pools are stable coins against stable coins, there's not a lot of asymmetric information there. Maybe we can have no trading fees because, because in some sense, the costs of inventory are, are zero or close to it. Well, that's not going to work because you have to provide a positive incentive for people to actually supply their liquidity. Um, and so there actually has already been some work on these topics. So let me uh, suggest for anybody who's interested in more of a deep dive on these particular points, uh, there's a paper by Agostino Caponi and Rui Gia on, on the arbitrage point. And actually, I have worked with Joel Hasbrook at NYU and Thomas Rivera on specifically thinking about fee levels um, at, uh, at, at, at decentralized exchanges. But, but I'll, I'll leave that uh, point alone then um, and move to uh, lending platforms. So the way lending platforms function is that they basically, or they typically create one market for a given asset. So you might have a market for ETH. You might have a market for USDC. What I was showing you actually at the start of this presentation was a market, was a single market for USDT. Um, and how is this market specified? Well, just as you need a sort of a pricing function for the DEX, you need a pricing function for these lending platforms. Because who's going to determine the rates that you're getting and who's going to determine the rates for, uh, for borrowers? 
Well, so you need a primitive, which is essentially an exogenous interest rate function, which is preset. It's again going to be built into the code, but it is a function. So it's not static. It's not like saying you will always be able to borrow at 1% or you'll always receive 1% or anything like that. It is a function. And therefore, the big question becomes what's going to be plugged into this function to capture the dynamic nature of the market? Well, the answer is these functions, first of all, they're, they're, they're used to give you the borrower side, the borrower interest rate, typically. Um, and they're evaluated at the utilization rate of that particular market. Now, what is the utilization rate? Well, the utilization rate is an endogenous object. And specifically, it's the endogenous proportion of funds borrowed in the asset. So to take an example, if I were to think of a lending uh, market for USDC, and if there were 2 million uh, units worth of USDC that had been lent to the fund, this is like the depositor side, um, but only 1 million are borrowed, that's a 50% utilization. So that's 1 million divided by 2 million, right? So there's an exogenous preset function, which is typically increasing. And the way it's determining the rate is it's just looking at any point in time at what the utilization rate is, which is available to it, of course, right? This is it can read whatever's happening in its own. It, this, is, this is going to be part of the state of that contract. This is going to be sort of built into the attributes of that contract. So it can read how much of the, uh, how much of the funds are in place how much is, and how much is being borrowed. And so it can compute the utilization rate. And it can take that utilization rate and it can plug it into this function. And that's how it's going to get its borrower side interest rate. That's how it's going to set it. So for example, when you have a sudden increase in borrowing demand, that's going to push up this utilization rate. And the function is specified to be increasing, so that's going to push up interest rates, right? Um, by the same token, if there's, a, if, there's, if, if, if there's sort of a negative demand shock on the borrowing side, you're going to have borrowers leaving, and you're going to have uh, the utilization rate fall, and the interest rates would fall. And you can do the same exercise, exercise on the supply side. So the whole idea here is that you know, the people specifying this understood you can't have a static rule for interest rates. You have to have some dynamism that has to incorporate market variables. And they thought, well, you know, this utilization rate is very easy to figure out. Um, we, can't, we can't just read in arbitrary information from the news media and try to figure out what you want the interest rate to be, but we can very easily figure out what this utilization rate is. So why don't we just choose the interest rate as a function of that thing? Okay, now that actually, what I was talking about is, is, the, is the borrower side. So what about the lender side? Because one of the things you have to ensure is that if I'm going to pay you something, I have to be able to pay it to you. And there's not even any I, I because it's a smart contract, right? So there, there, there can't be really a temporal mismatch in terms of me paying you, uh, meaning me, the, the platform paying the depositors, right? So how do you make sure, for example, that, that the lenders to the platform, the depositors, are actually going to get what it is that, they, uh, th uh, that, that, uh, that, that you're saying they're going to get? Well, essentially, a, a lot of these platforms, what they do is they pass a fixed proportion of the borrower payments on to lenders, right? So you can see what the borrowers are giving you, um, and, and you can just fix a particular proportion to pass along. Um, now, this is uh, frequently sort of you know, used as, as an advantage for these platforms in the sense that um, the, the specific proportion that's set is typically pretty high, like in, at least in terms of traditional pass-throughs, so let's say over 80%. And so most of the value that is being, in, is being accrued uh, from, the borrower, uh, from the borrower side is being passed on to the lender side. So, so, I mean, the truth is actually this parameter is set as an attribute and it can be changed um, through the governance process for the platform. But in principle, you, know, you could have hard coded it as some high value and then you wouldn't worry at all whether the pass through is going to, for example, fall um, if, if suddenly the platform had market power. But, um, even so, in practice, again, the numbers are pretty are typically set to be quite high. Um, so, so there is that advantage of, of the fact that you're getting a pretty high pass through, and the process by, for for changing it um, would involve going through sort of the governance structure of the platform. Um, so, you might reasonably believe that you're going to get a pretty high pass through relative to traditional institutions, even if um, if there were market power uh, in the setting. Um, but so this comes back to that credible commitment point. You can commit to a certain pass through if you like. Um, okay, uh, so with that, uh, let me actually conclude and, and uh, I'll take questions for the rest of the session. But uh, again, this is basically just uh, a high level overview of, of this particular survey uh, with Coast John and Leonard Kogan. Um, if you're interested in reading the full survey, um, I have this tiny URL here that you can easily access. It's on SSRNs. 
Um, with, uh, but you can get there with this shortcut, tinyurl.com slash decentralized finance. Um, and the paper will be uh, published in the annual review of financial economics, I think, uh, next year. Uh, so with that, I will stop the main part of the presentation. <laughs>